in the glory of your presence I find rest for my soul in the depths of your find peace and makes me
Pray. 
presence never the same I am a wild horse Bring me in Bring me in Train me Trial trainer Bring me Bring me in Trial trainer Train me Bring me in Bring me in Trial
Just stay here for a minute. <laughs> Don't think I have the words quite to articulate it, but it, something in the vein of yes, he is loving, yes, he is kind. But if we only, I guess if that's the predominant attribute all the time, and the, and the reverence and the fear, the godly fear, is it's not there enough. I guess for me it's easy to just in the little things that stack up over time, it's easier when I just think of him as in his forgiveness and his faithfulness and his loving kindness only that those little things, you know, maybe they don't matter that much. But if you think about his attributes of fire, justice, 
judgment, righteous judgment, holy fear, holy terror. Maybe it changes the way we do little things. I'm just going to keep playing quietly, I guess, if the elders have anything or anyone has anything, but if I could just uh, maybe a space to reflect on that reverent, holy terror, fire, nature of God. pray right now, Lord, thank you so much for the way you've led us so far, and we do pray right now, Lord, like it says in Romans, behold the kindness and the severity of God, and we're very much aligned with your kindness in America, but Lord, we're very much unfamiliar and don't like your severity. And I, I pray, Lord, even as Drew has been led today by the Spirit, Lord, that you would put within our hearts today, Lord, a new fear of the Lord. Just, 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 let's just stand for a second. And just everyone, just uh, even the youth and the young people and everyone, just we want to ask the Lord to put inside of us a, a real fear of God that's by the Spirit of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a treasure. The fear of the Lord keeps you from sinning. The fear of the Lord uh, is clean, enduring forever. And the fear of the Lord is so needed right now in this nation, in the church, in the times we live in, and even the gospel that has been preached in America for so many years, absent and devoid of the fear of the Lord. And those kinds of things. And we just cry out to you, Lord. Like, like Drew was saying so well, I was thinking of like the Song of Solomon where the bride says, catch the foxes that are spoiling the vineyard. And for most of us, it's not something big. It's a compilation of many small choices like Drew was singing that, that spoil the vineyard, that spoil the garden of our hearts to you, Lord, that Keep us, Lord, in this place of not pressing on into purity and holiness and, and sanctification and the fear of the Lord. And we just pray right now, Lord. Just pray that you would put the fear of the Lord into our hearts. Just pray, God, that you would put the fear of the Lord into our hearts. Lord, by the Spirit of God, by your grace, Lord, we desperately need the fear of the Lord. We need to tremble at your presence, Lord. And we cry out, Lord, that you would unite our hearts to fear your name, God, like never before we pray. That we would see you high and lifted up, the train of your robe filling the temple the elders casting down their crowns, the seraphim covering their faces, singing to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Lord, the glory that emanates and radiates from your throne, from your person, brighter than the sun, John saw you, he fell down like a dead man at your feet. When Isaiah saw you, he said, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Lord, I pray that you would refine us, and Lord, put the fear of you in us. Put the spirit of the fear of the Lord within us, we pray, Lord. Let us not be casual, Lord, with you. Lord, yes, we can be your friend. Yes, we can have a deep, intimate, communing relationship with you. Yes, we can call you Abba, Father. 
Yes, we can call you bridegroom, God. Yes, Holy Spirit, you are closer than our skin being grafted to us, spirit to spirit. But Lord, I pray where we can become casual, where familiarity can cause us to approach you with a really the kind of attitude that can get us killed, really, talking about the Holy of Holies. We cry out, Lord, that you would put the fear of the Lord back into our hearts, back into the hearts here in this church, back into the hearts of the remnant in this nation. Lord, back into the hearts of the people who live in America, back into the hearts of the American church. Lord, that we would fear you again, your judgment. You are clearly rising up in judgment in this land, in this hour, both in the church and in this nation. And I pray, God, help us to fear you. Get the compromises out, Lord. Just expose to us the compromises so that we could walk in purity and holiness before you. The fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord brings cleansing. Lord, just, just let the spirit of the fear of the Lord cleanse our hearts right now from other loves, from other desires, God, from other things. And I pray that you would give us, Lord, by the grace of the living God, a fresh hunger, a fresh thirst for you, Lord, to return back to our first love, to return back into that place of intimacy and communion and devotion to you. We pray, God, that we would repent and return and come back, we pray, and sustain us with the fear of the Lord, which is our treasure, we ask in Jesus' name.
love you. Just tell the Lord we love him. We love you, Lord. Lord, we honor you today. Just tell you we honor you as king. We honor you as Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the incredible blessings that you have done in our lives, for your healing, your miracles, Lord, your just provision, Lord, the way you are, Lord, hopefully beginning to move in this nation, Lord, and to bring us back to our, your original intent for this nation. Lord, we want to honor you as we approach Thanksgiving in a couple, not, not next week, but the next week after that. Lord, we just want to say we thank you, Lord. We thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you. Just give the Lord thanks. Just thank the Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Just stay in this attitude of worship. I, I so appreciate Drew and Bethany leaning us into the presence of God like this. And it was beautiful. It was really just so right on spot with what the Lord, the Spirit is saying to the church and the emphasizing right now the need for the fear of the Lord and his holiness and things like that. But you may be seated. We want to move right into the message here, which will flow with kind of the theme of this uh, service. And anyway, we want to just go online, Ben, whenever you give me the thumbs up. Really great worship. So everyone just want to welcome everyone in person and online and, uh, you know, this is the last Sunday before, um, well, next Sunday we're going to have house church. It'll be, I'll make the announcement later, but next Sunday's house church. So we'll, this will be the last Sunday for me speaking. So I just wanted to kind of bring a, kind of is a mix of a message of thanksgiving for what God has done in our nation with also a challenge to the American church of the great need of the hour to pray and to stand in the gap and the inter intercede. Um, I want to start today with uh, Romans chapter 1. You should turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 21. And I mentioned in my message last Sunday, the low point for me in, in terms of where our nation had fallen was I believe it was last Easter. I'm getting, may get the facts wrong, but it was last Easter, I believe, and the Biden administration had a transgender celebration day on Easter. I believe those were, that's right. Uh, I didn't fact check this, but you might want to fact check me. But th that was the lowest part for me, just seeing all over social media, trans a transgender woman with breast implants, just exposing herself on the White House lawn, just like, how have we gotten into this condition? How has our nation gotten into this condition? And though elections can definitely help change that, the real core issue is found here in Romans 1, 21, where Paul lays out the, the, the descent into human depravity, but he really points out right here in verse 21 the root cause of it, which is if we want to get America back to where we need to be, we got to start here with Romans 1, 21. For even though they knew God, and I would say that's very true of America for the most part, we're, we have very strong Christian roots in our history. We knew God. Here's where our issue is. We did not honor him as God, like we were singing about today in worship. We did not honor him as God. We did not hail him as King of kings and Lord of lords. We did not fear him and give him the fear he deserves. And this is really... Also, what, what, what happened is we did not give thanks. And as we approach Thanksgiving, I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that God, I don't believe, has, is done with America yet. I had my doubts. <laughs> I really, really had my doubts. Lord, are you done with this nation? Are you sending us, in, us into judgment, into captivity? I don't believe that we're there yet, thank God. I don't believe God has given up on this nation. And as we approach Thanksgiving, it's important that we, we are thankful to God for the origins and the history and the founding of this great nation. I'll tell you, I don't know what's happened, but it, it, it's sad to me that so many Christians who live in America 
don't know the true history of this nation and the founding of this nation and God's fingerprints on this nation and the spirit moving to form this nation. I mean, you, you, ought, to, you ought to go back and read um, history. You ought to go back and I recommend even the book, The Light and the Glory, if you want to read about that, just the, the move of God to establish this nation. You know, there's a saying that there's a saying that people say that history belongs to the victor. I don't know if you ever heard that, that saying, but history belongs to the victor. And the idea is that whoever wins the war controls the narrative. Whoever wins the battle controls the narrative and the stories and the history. And so even in this country where secular, secularism and humanism and the progressive agenda has won and really conquered the education and the brainwashing of, of this nation, we have lost the history of this nation. We have lost what God did in the founding of this nation. And we've got to return back to the roots of what God did originally in forming this nation if we want to be the nation God has called us to be in these end times. So this message today is a message of thanksgiving. It's a message of challenge to the American church. This is not a, a, cha a call to a Democrat or a Republican. This is a call to the church in America. To I believe this is what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church in America. It's time for the church in America to become watchmen on the wall. Watchmen on the wall, intercessors for their nation. Yes, there is a call to pray for Israel. There is a, like Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen all day and all night. Take no rest for yourselves and give God no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. In other words, God appoints watchmen to pray for the destiny of Israel. But I believe also, just applying the scripture, God appoints watchmen, the church, intercessors, to pray for their nation. This is a call to prayer, and for a call to call the church in America to pray for their nation for the destiny God has for this nation. I was listening to a radio show today, or not today, last week, and the radio show host was comparing, he, he was comparing the national anthem and how the, the, the national anthem, the origins of the national anthem, you know, for, just to be honest, I, you know, I don't really think about the national anthem. I'm more worried about if Georgia's going to beat Tennessee. I don't think about the lyrics of the national anthem and, you know, just, but, this, but the radio host was telling the story and I was like, that's amazing. I, you know, I, I feel really dumb that I didn't think about the, the story of the, uh, of the, how the national anthem was created, but it was, you know, you, you, if you know, you may not know, Francis Scott Keyes, we were in, I didn't even realize this, I slept through history in high school and I slept through his, don't tell Anna, I slept through history in high school, I slept through history in college. But now it's like you start getting interested in this. Like, oh, this is pretty interesting. Is I didn't realize the War of 1812 was called by some the Second Revolutionary War. I don't know if anyone knew that. But America was in battle against Great Britain for a second time. And the British had come into, in the siege of Baltimore, had come in and burned down Washington, D.C. They were now launching an offensive against Fort McHenry in the Baltimore Harbor. And Francis Scott Key was going he was a 35-year-old lawyer. He was going on board to a, a British ship to negotiate the, the release of a prisoner. And on board, he overhears the British talking about their, their plans to bomb Fort McHenry. And the British say, you can't leave. You've got to stay on this ship until this battle's over. So Francis Scott Key is watching, and he sees at dawn's early, or he sees at the twilight last gleaming, the flag is standing over Fort McHenry, and all through the night, bombs are blasting and all this stuff, and he doesn't know, will the flag still be standing when this is done? And he says, and, 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 you know, you, you, if you know the, the lyrics, he says, oh, can you see by the dawn's early light? He didn't know, he did not know, it was a question, he did not know, would the flag still be standing after that battle or would we be at twilight's last gleaming? And I really believe that's kind of where, and I heard the radio show host say this, that this is kind of where we are in America. Are we at the twilight of this constitutional republic? 
Or are we at the break and the dawn of a new day? I have both hope, I have more hope for our nation right now than I've had in a very, very long time, but I also have a sober awareness that we are at a major crossroads, that the nation of America is a major crossroads, and the church in America must get on the wall and intercede and pray for the destiny of this nation like never before. The destiny of America hangs in the balance. The destiny of America hangs in the balance. We got to look at Germany, for example. Now, I love Germany. My ancestors, Kessler, when we went over there in 2017, we saw Kessler in Germany more than we saw it here ever in America. And we realized that we are the kettle makers from Germany and Austria. And I love Germany. I I love the food. I love the people. The coffee is incredible. It's just an incredible place. But when I was there, I was thinking, okay, how, what a warning Germany is to America because Germany was the catalyst of the Protestant Reformation through Martin Luther and the printing press. The, the, The breakaway from the Catholic Church and all that that was was spearheaded by Martin Luther when he received the revelation of justification by faith. And and through the the printing press and all that that did to release the gospel, the true gospel, the recovery of the true gospel throughout Europe. And even you, I, I believe even historians have rightly said that without the Reformation, there would not have been America. And how Germany was used so powerfully by God for the for the spreading of the gospel. Yet through over time, the Germany, through secularization, liberalism, through the Enlightenment ideals, Germany began to descend into greater and greater darkness, eventually giving rise to Hitler and the Holocaust. Now, America, st- listen, America stands at a very similar crossroads. Like Germany, we very much have uh, our roots Uh, rooted and established in Christianity. But whether we go on as a nation to fulfill our destiny, do you know nations have destinies by God, intended by God? A lot of people, you can read the scriptures, that God has destiny for nations and prophetic plans for nations. And it's up to the church, I believe, to pray for their nation, for God's destiny to be accomplished because there is great conflict and great battle. But will we go the way of Germany and descend into darkness or will we become what God originally intended for this nation? I don't know. I think the the battle is still out. I have hope. I have great hope. The battle is about, for this nation, is are we going to be a constitutional republic or are we going to get rid of the heritage and the founding God established through our founding fathers? Perhaps you've heard of the story where in 1787, the Continental Congress or the Continental Convention is taking place and our founding fathers are debating about what form of government are we going to have in this nation. And after they were done a lady comes up to Benjamin Franklin and says, uh, he says to her, or she says to him, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? And Franklin replied, a republic, if you can keep it. What an incredible form of government that I believe the Lord himself helped establish in our foundings. It's we have a republic if we can keep it. That's the battle right now. Are we going to remain a constitutional republic maintaining our own national sovereignty or are we going to go the way of the push for globalism and the rising up of the Antichrist kingdom, which is now rising up, rising up through the European Union and the UN and the World Economic Forum and the WHO and all these different three-letter organizations that are trying to push on global government Is America going to remain a constitutional republic as intended by God and our founding fathers? Or are we going to surrender our national sovereignty and move into global government from this antichrist system that's rising up? 
That is where we are. That is what this whole battle is about. Now, I know if, if you get on, I, I'm on Twitter all the time, and I like it because it helps me understand the thought process of this nation, where people are thinking and what they're thinking about. I guarantee you if somehow this message goes viral, someone would accuse me of being a Christian nationalist. I don't know if you've heard that term. Have you heard that term, Christian nationalist? I hate that term. I want to ban it from our vocabulary. It's so confusing. Like, like you know, it's like if you, if you want to really annoy me, call me Pastor Brian. And if you really want to annoy me, call, say, Pastor Brian is a Christian nationalist. You will really get under my skin. Please, you know, now I know my brothers are probably going to start doing that. But in today's culture, if, if, if you love your nation and you desire to be guided by biblical principles as in its founding and honor the strong influence of Christianity that was at its beginning in its history, that does not make you a Christian nationalist. Now, I'll, I'll explain. Basically, a Christian, actually, the definition is so vague, I, can, I don't even hardly, it's almost as difficult as trying to define a transgender or whatever, binary, non-binary. I mean, it's just so vague. I hate the term. But it's possible, listen, I think it pleases God that we can honor and pray for our nation to align with God's purposes without idolizing it. We can, we can desire for our nation to prosper and to fulfill God's purposes without, without putting it above the kingdom. We can honor the flag without elevating it above the cross. We can stand for biblical values without trying to get rid of the First Amendment, which gives religious freedom. We can pray for God's purposes to be placed within our president and his administration without becoming partisan. Let me say that one more time. It is possible, no matter how you voted, to pray, God, would you put your purposes for our president and his administration into their heart so that we can fulfill your purposes without being partisan. I mentioned last Sunday, Revelation chapter 17, God himself puts into the heart of the Antichrist in 10 Kings. I'm not calling Donald Trump the Antichrist. Some people, oh yeah, I agree with you, he is the Antichrist. Okay, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying God can put into the heart of very flawed people his purpose to carry out his purpose, and to bring justice to execute his plan. So we can actually pray, God, put into the heart of the president and his administration your purpose for this nation, even if they have selfish motives, so that your will can be done. You can intercede for God to fulfill his destiny for America without believing America is the new Israel or without believing that America is God's favorite nation with a manifest destiny. You can advocate for the return to Christian values that shape this nation without trying to turn it into a theocracy or without trying to get a, get or make every single person a Christian. Listen, America is not going to ever be a fully Christian nation again unless we have a third grade awakening. I mean, no amount of legislation or laws can, act, can ever change the heart. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. But we, th this is what I believe, this is what I call myself. I'm not a Christian nationalist. I'm a Christian constitutionalist. I want to see, as a Christian, our nation go back to the Constitution that our founding fathers established through much prayer and reliance upon God. And I believe, I believe it was divinely inspired, this form of government and even the Constitution. Obviously, not even not even remotely close to Scripture, but it was, you can see the wisdom of God in our Constitution. I believe God led our founding fathers. That is what I'm advocating for, is that we, that we maintain our constitutional republic through intercession and prayer. It's a call to pray for America's destiny. I just want to lay out four things that I believe America, God's purpose for this nation is meant to be from the very beginning and the founding of this nation, and we're to intercede based on God's original intention. Is number one, I'm going to explain some of these in more detail, but number one, America was meant to be always, from its very beginning, a refuge for those persecuted for their faith. I love that about our nation, that we can have a nation where we can be protected from religious persecution. 
Number two, resist the Antichrist spirit, the Antichrist kingdom, and ultimately the Antichrist himself. Number three, send the gospel to the nations. And number four, remain a beacon of light, liberty, and justice to the nations. That's really, I believe, and I'm going to explain this in, in more detail. That's what I, I believe America and God's original intention was meant to be from the beginning. And intercession is going to be what it takes for us to remain that in these end times. I believe that America can, can go the way of Germany. We're at a crossroads. But I also believe God is giving us an opportunity right now for a great turnaround. Therefore, we must respond in prayer and intercession. Some have prophesied that the rebirth of America is at hand. I think that's true. That doesn't mean it's going to happen because some of these things are conditional. God can reveal his intention. God can reveal his desire. But a lot of that depends on will the church align themselves with the Lord in intercession and pray for God's will to be done in heaven as on earth, in this nation as it is in heaven? Or will we just become complacent and apathetic and say whatever will be will be, I'm just going to totally focus on the kingdom of God, which we need to focus on the kingdom of God, but we also need to focus on our nation. So will we take this opportunity we have before us where God is, I believe, I believe, I really do believe this is what the Lord is saying to the, the church in America, to this nation. The rebirth of America is at hand. The rebirth of our constitutional republic is at hand. Will you partner with me in prayer and intercession for this to take place? If you, turn, if you have your Bibles, turn into your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 20, or actually, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21. Isaiah 1, verse 21. And obviously, Isaiah is talking about Israel. He's talking about God's plans for Israel. And I'm not in any way trying to take Israel's scriptures and say they, these are written about America. I'm, but I am saying I believe there's a parallel to where we are as a nation to where Israel was and really is right now and will be in the time of the Lord's return. But Isaiah was prophesying about the nation of Israel. And I'm just going to, I'm going to apply this just for a moment. I'm going to take this out of context and just make application to what I believe the Lord is saying to this nation right now is I believe the Lord is saying how the faithful nation has become a harlot. America at its foundings was one nation under God. We had the first great awakening. And if you study the first great awakening through Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and John Wesley, that through their, their powerful preaching, that I think it was George Whitfield, he said, I have in my heart a vision to unite 13 colonies as one nation under God. And then when, when the leaders gathered together, they, they said, we will have no king but Jesus. There was a first great awakening in this nation that brought the nation into a, an incredible conversion, bringing them under, under, the, under God as one nation under God. And then God miraculously gave us victory over the British. God miraculously, I believe, inspired our government, our constitution. He's been with us from the beginning. But America... Losing our foundations has become like a harlot. Some have even called America the harlot Babylon. I don't believe the, I don't believe the harlot Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 is describing America. But I believe definitely you could say, yeah, that's a, that's a, there's similarities there. We have in many ways lost our origin, lost our roots, our Christian roots, and we have in many ways become a harlot. She who was full of justice. America used to be a nation of justice. Justice for all. But now, if you've been following the things that have been going on in our nation, we have lost the rule of law. We have lost justice in this nation. We used to have a, a nation of justice. We used to have a nation of truth. We used to have a nation 
that was governed by the Constitution, but now this nation has flung justice to the ground and it means nothing except to weaponize it against a political opponent. We've got to get justice back. Righteousness once lodged in her. I'm not saying America was ever perfect. We had many, many flaws. I'm not saying we were ever anywhere close to what God wanted, but we we're you know, probably way better than we are now. But now murderers, 63 million babies abor aborted in the womb. America has endorsed and, and killed 63 million babies. That describes, I believe, this describes where America is. Your silver has become dross. Your drink diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. That totally describes our nation, our, the leaders of our nation. Our leaders, they love a bribe and they chase after rewards. You want to find out why, is our, why do we make these crazy decisions? Why do our leadership, why is it when you elect these, these candidates they go off and they do the same old thing and they don't do whatever they said is because they're, they're, they're pursuing a bribe. They're being bought and paid for. See, this describes exactly what is going on in our nation. Our leadership is corrupt to the core because they're love and chase a bribe. Now, um, verse 24, the Lord says, Therefore the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. Verse 25, I will also turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloy. I believe that America at this present time is in a time of purging, a time of cleansing. You know, just as we have seen in the, in the church over the last year or so, God has been exposing and exposing leaders in the church. God has been judging leaders in the church. God has been exposing the sins of leaders. God has been bringing it out. He's bringing justice to those who have been harmed. I believe we are in a similar place in this nation. God is bringing justice. God is bringing divine order. And divine order comes through judgment and justice. I believe God is wanting to purify this nation to bring us back to the founding vision of our founding fathers, a constitutional republic for the people, by the people, and of the people. Not a government run by a fourth branch of government called the administrative state or what some have called the deep state of unelected bureaucrats. I believe God is moving in this nation, and that's where we got to pray, to align ourselves to see the corruption in the government and the deep recesses of the government cleansed and purified so that America could be what God intended for her to be. Then the Lord says, I believe this is, what I'm saying is I believe this is God's heart, God's intentions, God's desires. You, obviously, you test it and see if you think the Lord's saying this. That requires prayer, but I believe this is the Lord's heart. This is where we're at. I believe it is God's desire to rebirth America in this season. I don't know how many years that will take. I think it'll take a lot. But I, I think God's looking for a response from the church. Will you partner with me, with me in that? I will restore your judges as at the first. God will, God will bring justice back into this nation so that the Constitution is the governing force of this nation, not political interest, not corruption, not bribes, not foreign interest. But, but God would bring back the, the judges as at the beginning and counselors as at the beginning. And after that, you will be called a city of righteousness, a faithful city. That's what I believe the Lord's heart is right now in this nation. And it's important that we pray and we partner with God in that. Even though that's true, I love this quote by Winston Churchill in 1942, November 10th, 1942. He said, now this is not the end. This is kind of where I believe America is right now as it pertains to getting back to our origin, back to the constitutional republic we were meant to be. Now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. 
but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Okay, a little confusing. What that basically means is the end of the war, he said that because they had a victorious battle that really shifted the momentum of the war. Of the war. And he said, this victory is not the end. This victory is not even the beginning of the end. But this victory is the end of the beginning. The end of that, the end of the defeat, basically, we were experiencing, and the beginning of us going on into victory. That's kind of where I believe America is right now. We are very far from where God wants to be, us to be. We're, but I believe there is a window of opportunity for this nation to be as it was at the beginning. Of course, in a modern context, of course, in a modern context, but it's important that we come together as intercessors and pray for America. If you get nothing else out of this message, please walk away with this. I need to pray more for my nation. I need to pray more what God wants for our nation. Let me talk just a little bit about <clears throat> praying that God would get us back to this place of being a refuge nation for the, those who are persecuted for their faith. If America goes the way of globalism, if America align, surrenders our national sovereignty, which I've mentioned before, we're very close to that uh, under the previous administration. We're very close to surrendering our national sovereignty to global government, to the World Health Organization, and a pandemic treaty. And if we were to ever do that, our religious liberties would be deeply threatened because the global agenda hates Christianity. And so we've got to fight because I believe, listen, this is what I believe is in the heart of God. From the beginning of the founding of this nation, and I'm going to show this in a minute, was God's heart for this land was to be a refuge from the Antichrist and from persecution, and especially in the end times, especially in the end times, that America would be a refuge from persecution from the Antichrist kingdom, not here yet, rising up and not here yet, the ten kings that will arise after this, and then the Antichrist himself. We stand at this junction where if we, don't, if we align ourselves with globalism, America will become, begin to persecute Christians in this nation. But I don't believe that's God's heart. I believe God has intended this nation to be a refuge from religious persecution. And that's why we need to pray. And, and it, now that we're close to Thanksgiving, is I love the story of the Puritans and the pilgrims when they came, you know, you don't really think about it when you're, you know, in kindergarten and you're just, you know, getting candy corn and dressing up like Indians and pilgrims and all that. But the story of it is incredible. Um, even, I think even our, our family, the Kesslers, fled Austria, Germany, Austria. Uh, we fled and came to Georgia, Savannah, uh, because we were being persecuted by the Catholic Church in, the, um, in, that, in Europe. And so... The, the way that America, the, the pilgrims and the Puritans, the, the pilgrims were what they call separatists. They wanted to separate completely from, this is in England, separate from the Anglican church, which was kind of like the Catholic church back then. And then the Puritans wanted to try to reform the church from within. But eventually they realized through persecution, okay, this is not going to work. They fled to the Netherlands for a bit. And then finally they, they said, we gotta, we're going to try to seek refuge in this nation that what they called the great wilderness. And I love, if you've ever heard of the uh, John Winthrop, if you've ever heard of John Winthrop, raise your hand if you've heard of John Winthrop. Okay, so we got to get educated. Okay, John Winthrop was a Puritan figure, the leader in the New England colony for 12 years, the mayor. And listen to what he wrote when he was journaling about whether or not he was still in Europe He's praying about, okay, Lord, should I come to America? And he's kind of, you know, wrestling through his thoughts, knowing the, the challenge it would be. And this is what he says. And I, I believe in this, you can see the intention of the Lord. See, a lot of times we think the founding fathers, George Washington, but I think John Winthrop was a major person who had the vision of God for this nation in his heart. 
He said it will be a service to the church of great consequence to carry the gospel into those parts of the world and to raise a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Which the Jesuits labored to rear up in those parts. All other churches of Europe are brought to desolation due to persecution. But who knows but that God has provided this place to be a refuge for many whom he means to save out of the general calamity, meaning the persecution in Europe, seeing the church has no place left to fly but into the wilderness. He's quoting Revelation chapter 12. I think it's like 13 through 14. When the woman flees the persecution of the Antichrist, and then God delivers the woman and brings her into the wilderness. That John Winthrop was saying that, I, he was saying that I believe America is meant to be one of those wildernesses, a, a nation of refuge from the persecution of the Antichrist. Isn't that beautiful? Like someone you probably never even heard of, that God was putting into this man's heart his vision for this nation, that at the end of the age, we would be a wilderness, we would be one of those places of wil the wilderness of protection from the Antichrist and his persecution against the church, that we would be a refuge nation that would resist the Antichrist and his agenda. I mean, I love that, that, that John Winthrop had this vision from the Spirit of God for what this nation was meant to be, from its very origins and is meant to be especially now at the end of the age as we head closer to the arising of this Antichrist kingdom that's emerging. We've got to pray that America will be a refuge from the Antichrist. Not only is America meant to be a refuge from religious persecution. But America is meant, I believe, to be a resistor nation. What I mean by that, you can look in Daniel chapter 11, there are nations that will resist the Antichrist. There are nations that will resist the Antichrist kingdom. And America is meant to be, America is meant to be a nation that would resist the emerging of this global government, this antichrist kingdom. We've got to resist the push for globalism. It would be devastating to this nation if we align with the UN's agenda, who is pushing for global government. See, Winthrop said that he envisioned this New England colony to be, colony to be a bulwark, a defensive wall against the spread or against the, the antichrist kingdom. See, in his day, it was coming through the Catholic Church. It was coming through the Anglican Church. In our day, this Antichrist agenda is coming through the uh, European Union, through the World Economic Forum, through the World Health Organization, through the UN. We need to stand and resist this push for one world government. America is not meant to align with the Antichrist kingdom and his agenda. We're meant to resist it. Let's look at now at Daniel chapter 7. Turn to Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. And we're getting now into some end time teaching here. And I would encourage you to read the whole Daniel chapter 7 to get the context of this verse so you can see it in context. But I think if you understand Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, you can see the beginning emergence of this kingdom. Daniel, the angel tells Daniel in this vision, he says, as for the ten horns, he sees ten horns, he says, out of this kingdom. Okay, I want you to see first, a kingdom is established. Okay, you get that? There's a kingdom before there are ten kings. There are, as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, so there's a, there's a kingdom that's established Ten kings will arise. And another will arise after them. That's talking of the Antichrist. 
And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue, subdue three kings. So what we've got now is first, there is an Antichrist kingdom. I don't believe the Antichrist kingdom is in place yet, though I believe the European Union and the World Health Organization and the UN and the World Economic Forum are, is the beginning of that. I don't, believe it, I don't believe it could fully be characterized as that yet, but it's, it's that at its beginning. It's emerging, it's arising, and you can even see the great push that America has had. And I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, the World Health Organization was, is pushing for a pandemic treaty which basically says in any future pandemic, you, lose, you surrender your national sovereignty of how you will handle a health crisis to the World Health Organization, and we decide what vaccines are required. We decide whether you have a digital ID to track your vaccinations, which eventually is going to lead to a social credit system like China, except it's more is on a global scale, and that basically you have to surrender your national sovereignty to us, to the WHO, and I'm like, that's insane. Yet our former administration was pushing that and was going to align with that. And that's, a, that's actually aligning us with this emerging Antichrist kingdom. That's not good. Now, I want, you to, I want to just say, read one thing that on, on November the 7th, 20, 2024, after the election... Donald Trump said, I am going to immediately terminate that treaty. <laughs> Praise God. Whether you like Trump, whether you hate Trump, whether you're in between somewhere, praise God that he is terminating this treaty. It would be devastating to this nation. He says, I am not going to allow public health to be used as a pretext to advance the march of global government. Praise God. Praise God. We are going to withdraw from the corrupt World Health Organization. We're going to work to forge a new coalition of nations that are strongly committed to protecting health while also upholding sovereignty and freedom. Praise God for that deliverance. That is not good. That is not good. America... And this is where I'm calling us as intercessors to understand the times and the seasons, to understand God's purpose for this generation, to be like the sons of Issachar who understand the times and the seasons with knowledge of what we must be done is we must pray to resist global government. So back to the Ten Kings. I don't know if you've ever heard of this organization called the Club of Rome. Has anyone ever heard of the Club of Rome? Mitch has probably heard of the Club of Rome. Michael, yeah. Just a few people have heard of the Club of Rome. It was founded in 1968, but basically it, it, what it is is a global think tank. It's a bunch of really smart, at least they think they're smart, uh, people who are trying to figure out, okay, how do we handle overpopulation? How do we handle resource depletion? How do we handle all the, gover the global issues we are facing? And I'm just going to make a long story short. Their, their final plan was released in 1973. And they said, we want to divide the world into 10 regions. Okay, this is not, they don't, they don't study end time prophecy. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, how, if it fully works out like this, I doubt it. But at least you see the mindset of the globalist uh, mindset. It aligns exactly with what Daniel said and what the book of Revelation says. Is that there will be ten kings that arise out of this kingdom. America must resist this agenda. Okay, for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, we cannot align ourselves with global government. Because we know where that's going. It's going, to, it's going to eventually give rise to the Antichrist. America cannot align ourselves with that agenda. So this threat must be resisted in prayer. Like I said, there are, there are resistor nations. Some people think like, okay, well, the, the, the Bible says the Antichrist is going to rule over the whole world. And therefore, what can we do? Some say, well, we won't even be here. We'll be raptured out. So what can we do? 
First of all, I don't think the scriptures say the Antichrist will have dominion over the, the whole world. I think only Jesus Christ will ever have dominion over the whole world. Satan wants that dominion, but I don't think God will ever let him have it. God wants to raise up resistor nations that would resist the agenda of the Antichrist spirit, resist the agenda of the Antichrist kingdom, and then ultimately resist the Antichrist himself. America is meant to be one of those nations. So, you know, the, like, I, I can just imagine me going to the, the Senate and saying this word. They, they laugh me out. But I'm telling the church because we can change things in prayer. We can get a hold of God's vision for this nation and through prayer and intercession, we can labor and we can intercede and we can say, God, fulfill your will and your destiny for this nation that America will be, be what it's meant to be. Our prayers can make a difference. So in conclusion, I want to call us to prayer, to pray for this nation, to pray for the destiny of this nation, to pray that America would be a nation of refuge always until the Lord's coming, to pray that America would resist the Antichrist spirit, the Antichrist kingdom, and the Antichrist himself to pray that America would continue to be a nation that sends the gospel out to the nations, to pray that America would continue to be a beacon of hope and light and liberty to the nations. We stand at a crossroads, and I believe the fate of this nation is at hand. It hangs in the balance. Therefore, the need to pray is like never before. Amen. Amen. Well, Lord, we do come right now, and we want to pray for this nation. Father, I have much hope for the turnaround in this nation, that it is, I believe it is in your heart to rebirth America. I believe it is in your heart to reform a, or reestablish our constitutional republic. God, I believe there are there are um, purposes that you have for this nation that, that you intend for us to fulfill. Lord, I am praying right now that the American church would wake up, that we would wake, wake up. Lord, that we would intercede for the destiny of this nation, even as we approach Thanksgiving, Lord. We pray that America would fulfill the destiny that you had for us at the very beginning. Lord, we want to come and we want to say thank you for the founding of this nation. Lord, thank you for the way you moved in this nation. Thank you for the outpouring of the Spirit of God in this nation. Thank you, Lord, for the founding of this government. We are praying in this time, Lord, that you would put your purposes for this nation into the heart of our leaders, into the heart of Donald Trump and his administration, into the heart of the House and the Senate, into the heart of governors, Lord, even if they have mixed motives and are doing it for themselves, you can still use that. But we pray that you would turn this nation back to you. We pray that you would purify the corruption in our government. We pray that you would release the fire of your judgment and your justice into corrupt agencies that are violating the Constitution. God, I pray that America would be a refuge nation from the attacks of the Antichrist, Lord, in the days to come, from the persecution of the Antichrist, in the days to come, that we would be a refuge of safety in this nation. Lord, we pray, I believe that is your intention. I pray that we would be one of those wildernesses, Lord, in Revelation chapter 12, that is protected, Lord, protected from the rage of Satan. We pray, stir up within your people, a deep desire to pray like never before. Put it in my heart. Put it in our hearts, we pray. Watchmen on the wall to stand in the gap for this nation. We pray, Lord, let your will be done for America. Let your kingdom come in America, we pray, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. We're going to end the online portion here. And... Um, so we want to go ahead now and we want to take communion. And maybe, Drew, could you and Bethany maybe come back up and lead us in a, a song here?
We're going to take communion around the theme of just being thankful for all that God has done. Um, just want to also invite people, if they want to share a testimony of thanksgiving, um, whether, you know, uh, maybe God has healed you or maybe God has given you a breakthrough or, you know, whatever it is you're thankful for. I, I, there's something powerful about just expressing our thanksgiving to the Lord of, of what he's done. And, you know, I, I think that, that this thanksgiving could be one of our best thanksgivings ever. Um, I love Thanksgiving. I wish our nation didn't rush right into Christmas. You know, it's like, wait until, you know, Black Friday or something, you know, just come on. Thanksgiving is an awesome, awesome time that, our, our, that we celebrate and thank God for what he did uh, in the founding of this nation. So anyway, if, if, if God leads you to, after we take communion, if God leads you to give a, a word of praise or thanks,